Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. Um, can we just take a second and celebrate Jesus for being the best father that we could ever have? Let's give it up for Jesus. Woo. All right, so today we're going to be talking about what it actually means to be last. Um, I don't know if you've ever really thought about what that would look like in your life, but we're going to be talking about how Jesus modeled that and also the way that he calls us to do the same. We're going to see how Jesus presented this to the disciples and that the way that they responded to that. Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I read the Bible and I see the responses or the actions of the disciples, I can get so frustrated because I'm like, Jesus is right there. Why, are you, why aren't you asking the questions? Why aren't you believing in all these things that you've already seen him done? Um, but then when I look at myself, I know that I make those same mistakes too. But we're going to get into the scripture. We're going to be in Mark 9, um, verses 30 through 35. And it says, And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had been discussing with one another which of them was the greatest. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So if you just think about like a date night with you and your spouse or your loved one, sometimes you want to go out and, and maybe have an experience, go bowling, maybe putt-putt. Um, maybe you want to go check out a new place or go on a double date or a group date with a bunch of your friends. Sometimes you want to have deeper conversations. You want a quiet, more intimate place to be able to go deeper with the person that you love. So maybe you go to a quiet restaurant, or you stay home to cook together, or maybe you just go for a walk and, and you're able to uh, just have those deep connections. So Allie and I have started something that we learned from Luke that we call the 777 rule. So every seven days, we have a date night. Every seven weeks, we have an overnight date or a date day. And every seven months, we go on a three to five night trip, just the two of us. That has helped us in our marriage in, in ways that I didn't expect it to, because sometimes we just get caught up in life, and sometimes we can't have those deep conversations. I mean, we're parents, we're both working. A lot of our conversations are about what food Oliver's gonna eat that night, and, and sometimes everything else just gets kind of lost in there. But having that time set apart for the two of us, we are able to connect and that's what Jesus wanted to do with his disciples. He needed a quiet space to be able to go deeper with them. Uh, and we see that in verse 30. It says, And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples. It's kind of interesting because sometimes when I think of Jesus, my first thought is the huge crowds, the thousands of people that are following him everywhere for the miracles and for his teachings. And, and I, just, I just always imagine him being surrounded by people. But he specifically took his 12 aside. He didn't even want the crowds to know he was there so that he would have this space to go deeper with them. So Jesus wants it to just be us and him sometimes, um, away from the crowd. And with his disciples specifically, he knew that when he was gone, they were going to be the ones who were going to teach. So he needed to make sure before he was gone that they knew what to do. So that brings us to point number one. Jesus wants quality time with his disciples. Disciple actually means taught one. And we are called to be disciples of Jesus. And we need to remember that it's taught one. It's not coddled one. It's not life is easy for this one. But we're just meant to be taught by Jesus. The difference in the Bible between the disciples and the apostles is disciples are taught ones and apostles are sent ones. 
Not all of us are called to be sent, but we are all called to be taught by Jesus. Spending time with Jesus isn't just always about the good feeling that you get when you, when you spend time with him. Sometimes I, I can spend time with him and be like, wow, like I feel great. Like That was amazing. Um, but when I really think about it, it's like, but what was he trying to teach me in that? I, I took that time with Jesus, and I, I made it more about myself instead of, of what he is trying to do in me. So I've been doing prayer walks for a long time, and every street that I walk, I've, had, I've assigned to someone in my life, so Allie, Oliver, my family, my friends, my, each of my students, and every time I would walk it, I would come home and just feel like a great release, because I was able to verbalize everything I wanted to talk through, but I realized I wasn't really being fully fulfilled from that until I learned that I needed to to have some space for Jesus to respond to me. So after a couple years of doing that, I started having a silent street in between each of my streets. And that is when I felt Jesus working in those moments because he was able to respond to me, but also he was able to give me peace in the things that I was struggling with or, or hope for someone that I was praying for. So when I was sending up my prayers and praying for everyone, my, my relationship with God was growing higher and wider, but there was, it wasn't going deeper. And sometimes we, we really need to focus on going deep before we can go wide. A tree can only grow as high and wide as its roots go down and wide. And we actually see that in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So when I would walk, there was fruit, but when I, when I walked and talked, there was fruit, but when I walked and listened, there was depth. So let's make sure that we are are spending this quality time with Jesus, not just speaking the entire time, but really having that space for him to respond to us. So in this quality time that he was having with his disciples, there was a lack of understanding, and so Jesus just straight up uh, addressed it directly. In verses 31 and 32, telling them, the Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. When he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. So some people think that this, this verse is about Judas, about how he betrayed Jesus, how he handed Jesus over. But everything in the Bible is leading up to this moment. Even in the Old Testament, everything is leading up to Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. So when you think about it, it's like no one man is powerful enough to hand over Jesus without his permission. So we see that Jesus willingly laid himself, gave himself over and laid down his life. Whatever happens, happens because he allowed it to. So our second point, Jesus willingly takes on the hard. This is a a present tense truth predicated on a past tense life. So Jesus was willing to take on the hard throughout his entire life, but the same spirit that was doing that now lives in us and is now taking on our heart and helping us through that. Jesus even said in the Bible, it will be hard. So today is actually a very important day in my life. Um, June 16th, 2010, I have tattooed on, on my ribs. That was a day that I was finally able to tell my family about some abuse that I went through as a kid. And I was mad <laughs> on that day. I, I thought that Jesus did this to me. My mom told me, you need to give this to God. 
And I was so mad at her. I was like, why, why would I give this to God? He did this to me. That's like a doctor breaking my arm and then saying, come to me and I'll heal it for you. And he's supposed to be my heavenly father. I know if my dad, my earthly father, saw what was happening, he would have stopped it. But my heavenly father wouldn't. I was just angry. But I had to realize that there is a huge difference between God allowing something in my life versus God doing something in my life. No one really talks about how hard it is to be a Christian. I mean, I just think about Job, everything that he went through, all of his kids dying, all of his servants, his livestock, everything taken from him. And we, we get to peek behind the scenes in the book of Job where it's the enemy bringing all of these things to God and saying, look at your servant. He has everything. Of course he loves you. And God allows him to take things away. And Job still follows Jesus. We need to remember that God can allow things for his glory. But we always have to keep in mind who is actually doing those things, which is the enemy. I mean, I've seen students accept Jesus for the first time, and the, and the first time they hit a roadblock or something is hard, they're like, I'm out. And it, it makes sense sometimes. Like, No one told them that life can be still hard as a Christian. We can romanticize it a little bit in our minds and just be like, just give it all to Jesus, and he's going to, to save you which is true, but when their addictions don't stop like they would hope to, or their family situation doesn't improve like they were hoping, they're just like, I'm out. And, and we need to talk about how it can be hard living as Christians to support one another, but also to know that we're not alone in our struggles. Because no matter where you are, you are not alone. So I'm doing this crazy thing with Luke and with Micah um, called the 75 hard. Um, the rules of that are you need to do two 45-minute workouts every day. One of them has to be outside. You need to drink a gallon of water, read 10 pages of a nonfiction book, follow any type of diet, but you have to stick to it and do a progress picture. This is all about health and wellness, but really what it's getting to is the root of our excuses. We can't have excuses when we're doing this. We need to make our life fit around what we're trying to achieve, rather than piecing this in throughout our day, hoping that we get it done. I mean, Luke had to do an outdoor workout a couple weeks ago in an actual tornado with a 103 fever. If we did this alone, it would be so easy to quit or to cheat, and no one would really know. But since we're doing it together, we're able to push each other on those hard days, on the days where we want to give up, on the days that there's a tornado outside and you still haven't done your workout, you have your brothers pushing you to be safe, but to get it done. Luke wrote on his gallon of water that he drinks every day, because hard is no excuse. And while I was reading through this and kind of preparing this, I just thought, what if we had that same mindset in our walk with Jesus? What if we were able to remove all of our excuses and to, to say to Jesus, hard is no excuse, I'm going to follow you. Jesus says it will be hard, but he also gives us the tools and the people in the fellowship to be able to get through those hard things. So think about maybe there's something hard that you're meant to do that you maybe you've been putting off, but you know that you need to do it to get closer with Jesus. But more importantly, who are you doing it with? Maybe that person isn't doing the exact same thing as you, but you can have someone to keep you accountable and to push you and, and to love you on those hard days. So that brings us to verse number uh, 32. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. The disciples really didn't have a category for what Jesus was saying to them. Like, okay, how do you know you're going to die? And you're, you're going to rise three days later? Like, what are you talking about? Like, they, they just weren't able to process that because 
they, they just didn't have a category in their head for what that meant. And they were con confused and afraid to ask. So this is one of the times when I'm reading the Bible, and I'm just like, he's right there. Like, ask him. He, he has the answers, but you're just too confused and afraid to ask. Like, what are you doing? But then I think of myself, and I think, how many conversations do I have where I have no idea what's going on? But I just like nod, nod, and just agree. And I mean, no offense, Garland, this isn't about you, but some of my students can just rattle off things like talking about a new video game or an anime they like. And I'm just like, wow, that's so cool. And I love to hear their heart, and I love when they share those things with me. But after our conversation, I probably couldn't tell you one thing about what that video game was about. <laughs> so, um, brings us to point number three. Following Jesus means asking questions that we're afraid to ask. How many times do we have questions but we're afraid of the answer? Or how many times do we have questions that we don't ask because we already know the answer? Maybe our question is, why is my life out of control? Why can't I get things back on track? Why can't I break this addiction? But the answer is, you need to spend more time with me. You need to give your time and money to advance my kingdom. Or you need to give up that sin that feels so good in the moment, but you know is bringing us further apart. I mean, we all have something that we know we need to give up. Whether it's gossip, talking about other people so that we feel better. Um, maybe it's our pride. We put on a brave face and, and try to show all the good things in our life because, because we, we are obsessed with what people think about us. Maybe it's lying, maybe it's addictions, maybe it's anything, but we know that it is there and that we need to give it up, but it's hard. It can be uncomfortable. But we need to get into the habit of asking Jesus these hard questions, no matter what the answer is going to be. So in my case with the abuse at first, I wasn't asking the questions because I didn't know who Jesus was. I was thinking of him as the judge or, or the prosecutor, like someone that is doing something to me, someone that is handing out the punishments in my life, and, and I didn't know why I deserved to go through what I did. But when I did learn who Jesus is and what his heart was for my life, I was able to start asking those questions. And, but even now, they're still, it's, it's hard to ask some of those questions sometimes, but we need to support each other in that. So we see that the disciples should have had a lot of questions for Jesus in that moment. But when they didn't, Jesus knew the questions they were asking in their hearts. And so he had questions of his own to get them to think about those things. Like, maybe just ask the questions. <laughs> it's it, it's kind of scary when Jesus has to has to start asking you the questions to get to the, to the heart of things. So we see in verse 33 and 34, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. So Jesus, again, wasn't asking them this question out of curiosity. He already knew what was in their hearts, but he was asking them those questions so that they could come to terms with what was in their hearts. So, um, Jesus actually does this a lot in the Bible. He does it to, to really um, show people his power, but he also does it for them to look inward and then see the magnitude of his power. So some other examples that we see in the Bible of this is the bleeding woman. And he turned around and said, who touched me? He knew who touched him, but he wanted her to address him. The man at the pool of Bethesda, when he asked, do you want to be healed? Of course he wanted to be healed, but Jesus wanted him to think about why. And then the woman at the well, he asks, where is your husband? And she says, I'm not married. And he says, I know because you've had five husbands and now you're living with your boyfriend. And so it made her see 
the magnitude of who he was, like who could have known what, what she was going through. And so point number four, Jesus's questions check our motives. So basically what was happening with the disciples was, hey, what are you guys talking about? Nothing. Well, actually, I know what you're talking about, but this is what you should be talking about. You are talking about who is first when you should be talking about who is last. You're talking about who is best when you should talk about who is the least. You talk about who's going to be the head when you should be talking about who's going to be the feet. You're talking about your prestige when you should be talking about your service. You talk about your wealth, but you should be talking about how you're going to help the poor. You talk about your pride, but you should be talking about humility. That must have been the most embarrassing feeling for those disciples when Jesus said that to them. Literally right after he announces that he's going to be killed, they are arguing about which of them is going to be the greatest. Everything they should have been talking about is Jesus, but they were making about it about themselves. And I know in my life I can do that too. When I'm dealing with a problem or, or struggling with something and I can make it so big that I think God is not big enough to handle it. But I should be talking about him and how he can do it instead of myself and why I'm worried about it. So point number five is ask yourself, what should I be talking about? So I guess on Father's Day, we can kind of, we can think of it in a different way um, that might be, that could happen like in, in our time. So imagine the best dad in the entire world is innocent, but he's being framed for a crime and facing capital punishment. He gets to see his kids one more time before he dies, but on the way for them to see their dad for the very last time, they're arguing about which of them is going to take over the family business. Like, I'm the oldest, I should take over. Well, yeah, you're the oldest, but I'm his favorite, so I should take over. Well, yeah, you're the oldest, and you might be his favorite, but I have the most experience, I should take over. Like, just imagine what that dad must have felt when he gets to see his kids for the last time, and that's what they're arguing about. Not thinking about all the memories of growing up, and and how great this dad was, and how he gave them everything they could have wanted, and supported them, and loved them, and set them up for the future, but they're talking about themselves? We are not called to surround our father and talk about ourselves. We are called to sit in his presence to honor him instead of talking about what we are entitled to and what we get from him. But how often as Christians do we walk around through life thinking that grace is something that we are entitled to or that glory is something that we deserve? Grace is is free, but it is far from cheap. Glory is our reward but it isn't deserved. Let us not cheapen the free gift that God has given us with grace and glory, but let's remember what Jesus had to go through to give us those free gifts. And he actually shows us how to do that in verse 36. Oh, sorry, verse 35. And sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all, and servant of all. One of my favorite things about Luke is his servant heart, the way that he loves to serve people. I remember when I first started hanging out with him and going around to his house, he never sat at the head of the table. He was always on the side, and any time anyone would come up, he'd be like, hey, take a seat here, and and he would give them the head seat at the table. And I thought that was weird, because that's just not the experience that I've had when I go to other people's houses. And so after a couple months of our friendship growing and stuff, I, I asked him and he said, that seat's not for me. 
I, I'm not the head of anyone who comes into my house. I reserve that seat for someone else because I am not over anyone. And that just blew my mind, especially as a pastor. Like, I thought that was like the coolest thing. Also, when we have our men's Bible study at his house, on Tuesday mornings, we get there at 5.30, but he's up well before that, making coffee, sometimes making homemade treats for us, um, and just setting up the table for us to be able to come and, and learn together and grow together. So point number six, am I modeling the servant life of Jesus? Christians who live for the world can't expect the evidence of the kingdom to be in their life. There, there won't be fruit. But on the flip side of that, Christians who live for the kingdom can't expect for the world to accept them. So my wife, Allison, she brought the juvenile justice ministry back to Maryland. She would go into the juvenile detention centers and serve the incarcerated youth in Baltimore City and the surrounding area. I worked at Hopkins at the time when she was doing that, and my coworkers thought that was the craziest thing that they ever heard. Like, who would willingly go into a prison to serve these kids? They were thinking about it in the way of, they deserve to be there, and they need to like just leave them alone, let them serve their punishment. But Allie's thought was, I need to teach them about Jesus, because that's the only way that they're not going to keep going back into the system. And I just thought that that was such a beautiful representation of Jesus, how he served the people that some of the church elders were like, you're hanging out with that person? Like, they, they're not godly, and, and Jesus is like, well, I have to teach them so that they can. So Jesus is the epitome of being the last. Remember that he willingly gave himself over and that he was killed, but now he is first in heaven. We can't achieve being first in heaven, but Jesus modeled it so well of how we should live our lives. And he mentioned it in John 15, verses 12 and 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So we choose to be last on earth for the glory of who is first in heaven. Not for the glory to be first, but for the glory of who is first. So the rest of the tattoo that I have on my ribs says, pain before the healing, healing before the victory, victory for his glory, June 16th, 2010. So around that time, I honestly didn't know if I was going to make it to June 16th, 2011. If it was for my glory, there's no way. I could not see past what had happened to me. I couldn't see how God could ever use something like that for his glory. But I was, I've been able to help people older than me who have been struggling their whole lives with this secret that they hold on to. Um, I've been able to share my story with a bunch of my youth that have gone through similar things like that. And today, on June 16th, 2024, 14 years later, I am able to share it with you also. So with Father's Day in mind and servitude in mind, fathers and men in general, we need to demonstrate what it is to live a life of integrity, character, and servitude. We need to be able to raise up the next generation of kingdom men. And everyone, Jesus has called us to sacrificially live a life of um, servitude so that Jesus can be seen through us. When we're serving other people, that might be the only Jesus that they see 
but we're able to shine our light through, we will shine his light through us so that people can come to know him. At Rise City, we don't want to be people who are known for talking about what we're entitled to. We want to be known as people who talk about how we can serve. And if we fall into that frustration of judging other people like I have with the disciples of how they should have responded or how they should have asked questions, we need to resist that temptation and be able to look into ourselves. I get frustrated with the disciples because I'm frustrated with myself. I see my mistakes lived out in them. I see they are in the presence of Jesus making those mistakes, but I am in the presence of Jesus making those same mistakes too. So Jesus is calling us for more. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for bringing everyone here safely and just allowing us to fellowship with one another. I pray that you would be with all of the dads here, that they would feel celebrated on this day. But I also pray that you would be with those who's, who struggle on this day, who might not have that father figure or have lost that father figure. I pray that you would be with them and that you would let them know that you are their father, that no matter what they've gone through in the past, that they can always turn to you and that they can see the evidence of you working in their lives from the start. I pray that we would be able to take this message with us, the worship from today with us, and be able to continue on this week and be able to show our light, show your light to those around us, Lord. I pray that you would allow us to see how we can ask the questions that we need to ask and how you can change even the hardest story into something for your glory. I pray that you would bring us safely back here next week together and that we would just be able to continue to celebrate the way that you have worked in our lives. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, everyone, if you would rise for our final benediction. So our family verse is Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Rise City, I pray that you would rise and shine this week and that you would be able to show God's light to everyone around you. I love you guys. Have a good one.